Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Hassan with another episode of the Influence Continuum. I have a very dear old friend and colleague with me today. I've been wanting to interview him for a really long time. Uh, Chris Killam uh, and I go back to the 1980s, uh, our friendship, and he's an author of 14 books. Uh, We'll mention a few of them, but his latest is called The Lotus and the Bud, Cannabis Consciousness and Yoga Practice. And Chris is a yogi, and uh, I've I've done it with him, and I've witnessed his videos, the five Tibetans, and all kinds of other things. Plus, you're a humorist. I remember in Search of the New Age, that was hysterical. I definitely think you should re-release that and update it to 2024. But your career is just so unusual. I know I have an unusual career, but you when do. people when people hear about your career, they're like, holy mackerel. But so let me just say you are um you're 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 a medicine hunter, author, educator, yogi, founder of Medicine Hunter Inc. You are an eth- ethnobiologist, you are a shaman, you are have been interviewed by every major media every venue, and you're a world traveler going into remote areas to find indigenous wisdom and indigenous medicinal herbs to try to figure out if there's a way that we can harvest them in an ethical way, taking care of the native people. Um, And just amongst the many things you've, you know, developed and brought to humanity, Ashwa, Ashwagandha, Kava, yeah. Mak. Did I mispronounce it? Tell me. No, 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 you're right on. Ashwagandha. Yeah. Okay. Kava, Maka, ro- Rhodiola, and on and on and on. And uh, the New York Times called you part David Attenborough and part Indiana Jones, which I particularly like because I've seen <laughs> you with your hats in, in various places that we've traveled around the world. Um, you taught at UMass Amherst for 14 years. I could go on and on, but I particularly, when we, when we've talked recently, you were talking about the recent big revival into psychedelic research and all the money that's being poured in. That's a topic I want to cover. You've also told me about how you you cry to see the Amazon being torn down at, you know, super high rates. And, and we're going to talk about that as well. And and just how important it is to have a healthy mind body um, relationship with our planet, and um, and and so with that, welcome to the influence continuum. Well, thanks, Steve. That sounds like a good menu. I figure by uh, the middle of tomorrow we should be through it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have no doubt because we've talked for hours at a time anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. but and, and I should also say we met way back in the 80s, early 80s, because I wanted to out the Yogi Bhajan and his 3HO cult. And I was introduced you, uh, to you by an ex-leader of it who said you could help me with marketing uh, my, my press releases against the cult. And uh, and that's when you revealed, oh, I did that too for a while before I left it. Yeah, so, I, w- I was in 3HO for four and a half years. And um, I, I was kind of unusual in that I, I wasn't actually recruited. I looked for it. I looked mm. all over for it. And um, then when I, I left, I was happy to leave. Uh, I found the the cult dimensions of it, the mind control, the hierarchical authoritarian structure, totally ridiculous uh, Mm -hmm. after a point. But I wound up with a lifetime yoga practice. I had to unlearn many of the bogus methods that Bhajan, who was too fat to practice yoga at all, uh, just made up wholesale. But but I still want, you know, to this day, I do two hours of yoga in the morning. And when I go to a hotel and I'm sleeping in hotels all the time because I travel all over the world. First thing I do when I walk in is suss out the position of the furniture and where I'm going to put my yoga mat down. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I have to credit 
that time, mm. uh, you know, with uh, really helping me to develop a rock solid practice, though all of the thing, the conditions that came along with that turned out to be wholly unsuitable for healthy life. Yeah, and I love that you said said what you just said because it speaks about how we can take what we've learned and use use what we've learned in in healthy ways and sure, help, sure. help other people. So you are a teacher, you are an educator, you've been on TV forever. Um, so let's just you know get into what what ignited this passion of yours to natural healing and looking for for herbs that can really make a difference well i i, I mean I, I could say it in one line i was a hippie in the 60s that should, <laughs> that should be sufficient you know it, it 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 turned out that among my friends we just kind of came quickly to the realization that things natural were better we weren't particularly informed Mm -hmm. We didn't have good information resources the way people do now. We really were kind of staggering around in the dark a bit. Mm -hmm. But our intuitions were mm -hmm. spot on. And, uh, you know, with the uh, wonderful and, and insightful assistance of things like probably too many uh, LSD trips mm -hmm. and a lot of other things, I, I wound up realizing that I wasn't really suitable for the kinds of occupations that I saw adults engaged in. Mm. It seemed very, very dreary to me. Yeah. And, and I remember sitting down on a couch in the student union of UMass Amherst, where I was a student, where I made up my own major called mm. mind-body disciplines because no other major seemed to be worthwhile. Mm. Um, and, and, and sketching out my fantasy Mm. which was that I would love to travel around the world, hang out with shamans and healers, learn about their medicines, and somehow, you know, help to make these things popular. And it took between then and that actually happening, oh, uh, a good 24 years. Mm. But it did happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, through very simple situations like working for free for natural food co-ops, you know, driving truckloads of things, unloading grains on weekends, building shelves, from that to gradually learning more and more and more about all categories of things natural. Uh, I wound up developing not only a passion for it, but also, fortunately, a, a real in-depth knowledge. And um, then I was fortunate in 94 mm -hmm. to be asked to be the lead sort of uh, herbal expert for a group mission to China. And I said, sure. Mm. And I went and had a good experience. And when I came back, I said to myself, you know, I could organize something like that far better than they did. Mm -hmm. I know the things I would do differently. And almost as soon as that thought leapt to mind, I was approached by some people who wanted me to work for and with them. And that began 28 years of engagement, traveling around the world, investigating natural remedies, helping to popularize them in media and having uh, not only the time of my life, but also deep, rich, meaningful, profoundly beneficial relationships with people all over the globe in very diverse uh, situations. So I, I feel extremely fortunate to be in the midst of an ongoing education. Yeah, and and uh, four million miles of airplane flying is a lot of a lot of miles. So you know you've been you've made friends with different tribes. You've been initiated as a chief, I believe, or you've been recognized yeah. as a, a fellow healer. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about those experiences for a minute? Well, you know, in the work I do, I go to different cultures and I, expressed in, I express interest in plants that are usually of great importance to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would never go to people in the Amazon and say, why don't you grow some oranges? I would, I would, you know, say, what are what are your the the most valuable plants to you? You know, can you 
help me out with this. And, and they know what I'm up to. They know that I'm in trade. They know that I would like to work with communities of people who are interested in that sort of thing. Yep. And when you express that kind of interest with real respect, Sure. Uh, with native people, then all of a sudden they can't do enough for you. Mm-hmm. They show you the world and, and they show me all the things I didn't know to ask them about because I didn't know about them, period. Right. I'm like, well, we'll go look at the uh, the best kava field in, in this particular part of Vanuatu, South Pacific. But before we do that, let's stop at the Hill of Blue Clay. And you go, the what? And then the next thing you know, we're all covered with blue clay and it does amazing things for the skin and, and on and on. Mm. So, uh, it, it, and, and in the course of doing my work, people have been, uh, they've honored me with different, you know, honorary positions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, you know, I am an honorary chief in the, in a Vanuatu South Pacific. I have a couple of tribal names in South America and, um, I am very grateful for that. You know, I, I'm a, I'm a guy from the suburbs, okay? <laughs> I'm an indigenous Framinghamite. I mean, right. you know, I don't have a native bone in my body. Mm-hmm. But, 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 and I don't try to go native either. But if I'm in a village and everybody's barefoot, I'm barefoot. If everybody's shirtless, I'm shirtless. If everybody goes to the waterfall to swim, I go to the waterfall to swim. Mm-hmm. You know, play with their dogs, play with their kids. Uh, you know, I try to give myself to the situation as much as I can. And this usually engenders a lot of warmth. And especially if I go back to places repeatedly, yeah. then those bonds become stronger and stronger. And I've had, I have had the best experiences of my entire life doing this work. Yeah, that's uh, incredible stories. And I see your pictures posted on social media of you with, you yeah. know, roots and, and explaining yeah. you're, you have an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of plants and their functions. Cause I, I, I know I, my friend, John Atak was asking you about Charlie Manson, uh, oh, sure. and, and, and what, what was, what was the, uh, asking about Datura. Datura. It's also known as loco weed, mm-hmm. and uh, datura is very common in the West, and it was common around the Spawn Ranch where Manson and his followers lived. And um, you know, I happen to know a lot about it. It, it, it interestingly is is a highly toxic plant. Uh, it's also profoundly psychoactive, mm-hmm. and three of the main constituents in it are considered by the World Health health organization to be essential medicines. Hmm. Uh, For example, if you've ever had an eye exam and you've had your pupils dilated when they put little drops into your eyes, that's scopolamine. That comes from Datura. Uh, So so, although scopolamine is probably synthetically made at this point, but, um, you know, I I, uh, was able to kind of pull that from my consciousness and, and, and talk a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, you know, there there are people out there who know a lot more about plants than I do, but I've, I've got a few thousand rattling around in my uh, headpan. Yeah, for sure. So um, I want to go back to, if I may, the topic of the moment, which is this rush to psychedelic healing medicines. And recently the FDA said no to MDA assisted psychotherapy because of concerns ethical concerns um, and and uh, but you know about ayahuasca you know about psilocybin you know about uh, toads you were telling me about yeah. bufo toads so talk to us about about your take on where where the world is at regarding um, moving from just saying, oh, it's illegal, it should be illegal, it's terrible, to recognition that there are actually good uses and, and, and how there needs to be ethical uses so people don't get harmed. Well, I mean, so, you know, psychedelics in general are those agents that can engender a mystical experience. Mm-hmm. The sense of the dissolution of the self, the mingling with the all and the everything, you know, usually in a state of majestic awe and love for all beings. I mean, really an exalted state. Mm -hmm. And 
There are many psychoactive products and plants. I mean, MDMA, for example, that the FDA FDA turned down, it's not a psychedelic. It's psychoactive. Mm -hmm. It's actually a 1938 Merck methamphetamine. Uh, But it, it, uh, just to clarify, the concerns that the FDA advisors had were really kind of hilarious. Mm. Typically, when you have a placebo-controlled study, one group gets the active stuff, the other group doesn't. Right. And the advisors were upset that very quickly the people who got the real stuff knew they got the real stuff because it comes on very fast. Right. Uh, I think that's the nature of the material, but they're very lost in their, oh, you know, you can't know what you've got, which is an absurdity. Yeah. Uh, so that was one of the big concerns they had. But in general, when you, if you consider something like ayahuasca, which, as you know, is a psychoactive brew made in the Amazon using a vine and leaves, and, and it induces visions and, mm-hmm. and, you know, mystical experience and all of that, that is the most revered and respected and honored medicine in the entire Amazon. Mm. Uh, Among many of the Native American tribes in North America, peyote, uh, peyote cactus, which contains mescaline, Mm -hmm. is considered the ultimate sacrament. Mm. And the Native American church is based on all-night prayer ceremonies under the influence of peyote. Mm. Uh, in the Peruvian Andes, where I've spent a lot of time, it's San Pedro cactus, which also contains mescaline. Mm. In Africa, it's iboga, which is probably the single best thing we know for getting rid of opioid addictions. And in fact, ibogaine, which is a pharmaceutical derivative of iboga, which is a root, was an anti-addiction medicine in the United States for a very long time until it fell out of use. Uh, What's happening today is that there is and has been a pharmaceutical gold rush Mm. to capture some of the magic, but more importantly, the money Mm. in psychedelics. Right now, many, many millions of people around the world do some sort of psychedelic every day. Mm. Magic mushrooms, ayahuasca, Iboga, peyote, San Pedro, um, or large oral doses of cannabis, which can also get you there. Mm -hmm. And they're not waiting for pharmaceutical companies to come out with these things at exorbitantly high prices. They're just not. But still, you have about 24 um, public companies that are developing psycho psychedelics and what's happening which is not a surprise is that they're running into trouble Hmm. because you know you can't take something old if you will like lsd and patent it Hmm. because it's already out there it's already a discovered thing uh so they're trying to create new psychedelics uh and get them through fda approval and just to put this into perspective steve The average cost from start to finish to get FDA approval for a drug is $350 million. Wow. And 1.5 out of 10 companies make it. Mm. So as, as this big, you know, euphoric pharma bubble has built and built and built, one of the things that's happened is, is, Companies have described that while they may have a new idea about medicine, right. the format of the the procedure for approval remains the same old game. Mm. And so we've seen a number of these previously euphoric pharmaceutical entities go out of business. Yeah. We've seen a number of them do what's known as uh, resource reallocation, which means getting their money out of it right. and, and moving on. Um, and what I and and I've been very aggressive in articles that I write in in publications like Lucid News and some others, uh, excoriating 
basically this gold rush mentality. Mm. <clears throat> and, and at the same time, there's a greater recognition that psychedelic therapy can be highly, highly valuable. So we have seen, like with Johns Hopkins Medical Center with uh, stage four terminal cancer patients, mm -hmm. people who take psilocybin, that's the active material from magic mushrooms under supervision, uh, almost uniformly have the greatest spiritual experience of their entire lives and lose the stress and fear of dying. Mm -hmm. And that is extraordinarily compassionate medicine. Yes. We see groups of veterans getting together, not necessarily in clinical settings, but getting together intentionally and doing psychedelics of different times and supporting each other to get through the, the terrible, terrible after effects of being in wars in Kuwait and Afghanistan and other places. So, right. um, and at the same time, uh, on top of this, you have a number of people going through courses to become psychedelic therapy, you know, assistants. And the problem is you don't have to ever have done a psychedelic in your life to be uh, an, a psychedelic assisted therapist. Which is so, ridiculous yeah, for anyone who... It's insane. Yeah. So I have uh, been especially uh, sharp clawed about that. Mm -hmm. In general, I think the... The big pharmaceutical gold rush is, um, you know, an arrogant and foolish and unrealistic endeavor. And I think there are very few companies that are going to survive. And if they do come out with pharmaceuticals, it's going to be way down the road. And uh, yeah, I just saw that Lycos, unfortunately, uh, you know, who had the MDMA trial, uh, they've just let go of a bunch of people. Mm. So, you know, it, it's it's not a it's not a favorable regulatory atmosphere out there i mean it's much more so than the 70s but uh off campus if you will millions and millions of people every day are doing psychedelics and they're not getting a single tab or or vial or anything from any pharmaceutical company right right so fascinating <laughs> yeah so i mean i'll i'll just you know, add the downside for me is when when people are stoned or they're on ayahuasca uh, and some person with no qualifications says he's a shaman and he's going to heal a woman of her sexual trauma mm -hmm. and rapes the woman, like that type of abuse is needs to be called out and 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 people really need to have high consumer alert. Um, versus just kind of like trusting that the cosmos will provide the right person. Yeah. Any, it, any words of wisdom about how to be a good consumer? Well, I, I think that, um, for example, many people go down to the uh, to the Amazon for ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. So it's become a very big thing. And there are lots of lodges and there are, there are lots of shamans and some are real and some are phony. Yeah, uh, I think you have to um, you can't regard these people as somehow being untouchable. You have to ask, you know, well, who did you learn from? You know, how long have you been doing this? You know, find out from other people is, you know, is Don Julio OK? And they go, God, no, Don Julio, all he wants to do is grope your tits. I mean, you know, you have to uh, I think you have to do some some checking of these people out. Right. And I would also say that. um you know, if people are in a ceremonial circumstance and a shaman misbehaves, uh, then as far as I'm concerned, all bets are off. Right. It isn't a matter of maintaining decorum. Yell at them, slap them in the face, shame them in front of everybody, whatever you have to do. We can't have that kind of bad behavior. There are many very good shamans. I mean, I've been in ceremony with about 65 shamans. Wow. And almost all of them have been really superb and ethical. Mm. One or two have gone off the rails over time. I know it, and I, I haven't been in ceremony with them as a result. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have people who are opportunistic, and you have people who go down to the Amazon. They do three ayahuasca ceremonies. 
they come back and they say they're a shaman. Right. And that's like, you know, brushing your teeth once and saying you're a dentist. It's not realistic. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's love- not real. Yeah, it's not real at no. all. And, no. and, and so, um, and it, your wife travels with you, Zoe Helene? She, she has done a lot of travel with me. And in fact, when we got married, I, I had to go do a work project in South Africa. And I said, look, you know, you're completely free to turn this down. But how would you like if that work project was our honeymoon? And she said, yeah, <laughs> and we had the time of our lives. That's and we've been, in, you know, we've been in Patagonia together and Costa Rica and in the Amazon many times and Jamaica and other places. Right now, she's pretty much full time taking care of her aged parents. Mm. But she is a very good traveler. And um, she she's gotten used to um, the kind of travel that I do that sometimes can be quite comfortable and sometimes can be very, very rough. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I, I admire her for that. I think it was, you know, taking a big leap to do some of this travel with me. Sometimes yep. I'm getting ready for a trip and she'll say, so is this a guy trip, which means potentially dangerous and very uncomfortable. I'll say, yeah, yeah, this is definitely a guy trip. You don't want anything to do with this. And she'd be like, oh, okay. You know, she knows mm-hmm. uh, some of it's just, like hilariously out there. All right. I want to hear a story of a guy trip that, uh, you know, is dangerous, please. I think it's that, I think it's that there are incidents in certain places. Yeah. You know, I, I have been in many nations in Africa, you know, South Africa, Namibia, uh, Ghana, Congo, which Mm -hmm. is ridiculous. Ivory coast, uh, Morocco, Cameroon, and I have to say that many parts of Africa are just plain very dangerous, mm-hmm. and especially for somebody who's not black. I was going to say for a white guy. Yeah, yeah it's a reverse kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I've had guns pointed at me. I've had guns pointed in my face. Mm-hmm. I've had, you know, people try to shake me down. I've been accosted by, you know, guys on the street. Uh, and And these things... You know, you have to handle these things with care. Um, I'm in a complete somebody else's neighborhood. uh, So I I try to maintain good humor and friendly attitude and, you know, not become arrogant and pissed off because that surely leads to bad things. I've been chased by pirates. Um, A lot of the um, dangers are things like heavy malaria zones. You know, uh, I mean, the single most dangerous thing in the Amazon, for example, or probably any tropical tropical places is a mosquito. Mm. Uh, And I've had malaria and I've had tropical diseases that have, in a couple of instances, you know, put me up for a couple of months. Mm. Um, And in general, um, I mean, and also there are places I go to where you have uh, terrorists operating. Yeah. Uh, some of them are narcos, but some of them are, um, you know, like Boko Haram in, in Cameroon oh, yeah. and, and other, you know, um, radical Islamic nutcakes running around with, with uh, you know, automatic weapons. Yeah. And you got to kidnap clear. people. You got to stay clear of these people. Yeah. So, so sometimes I know I'm going into one of those situations and even if Zoe were free to travel uh, more than she is right now, I wouldn't want her to come. Right. I understand. So you've been traveling for decades. Yeah. And we know there are some people who are believing the disinformation that there's no such thing as climate warming and, and cl- <laughs> climate change. But you've seen actual villages, forests, like share what you're seeing everywhere i go steve Mm. i I, i'm very repetitive actually i ask the same i ask people the same questions all over the world you know whether it's what's this plant for do you grow it how did you learn about it was your granny an herbalist i mean all of that yeah and i also ask people everywhere tell me you know are things the same now like the same weather conditions the same you know, heat, the same rain. I've never gotten a yes. 
Hmm. Never. It's always, oh, no, man, you know, rainy season used to be May. Now it's April and July. We can't figure it out. Or, you know, that messes up our crops. Or, no, no, you know, we haven't had rain. I mean, I was in Namibia on a project. They hadn't had a drop of rain in eight months. Wow. And people had to walk for miles to go to wells. I mean, just like you, you know, see in National Geographic uh, documentaries. Mm. And they were completely on the ropes. Mm-hmm. Um, and and this, there's no question that there's enormous global climate change. And at this point, um, anybody who sort of lashes out against that is just a truculent idiot. You know, it, it's, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, an absolute determination that there's really no such thing as gravity and that people just fall down only because we've all agreed to do it. Um, you know, I mean, the th- I get the UN reports on global climate change. And I usually only get as far as the executive summaries because they're so gloomy. Yeah. Uh, and I do see uh, all over the world, the great forests of the world being cut down, burned down, bulldozed. Uh, you know, we have now these huge Mennonite communities moving into the Amazon, clearing huge tracts of land, mm-hmm. putting up walled communities, and in general, being really kind of unpleasant crackpots, just squatting on what should be virgin rainforest. Right. Um, so it, it's not it's not a good scene out there. We have rising tides. We have, I mean, here uh, in Massachusetts, we have had a tropical summer. Mm-hmm. Extreme, extreme, scorching hot, sunny days, and absolutely torrential tropical like ball bearing style rain mm. uh, that's not what i grew up here right that's not what this was like you grew up in the northeast yeah you know, it's all different now mm. and um you know we need to be able to adapt to this and part of it is reducing our carbon footprint part of it is stopping putting toxins into the environment i i, I want to give a a negative call out to whole foods for its increasing use of clamshell plastic packaging, Mm. uh, which is 10,000 year trash, Mm. uh, you know, terribly toxic to produce, absolutely unnecessary. It's only because stuff stacks well that they use it. Uh And, uh, you know, I, I am sorry to see that kind of thing, just more and more and more plastic everywhere when we can I don't know if you've ever gone to the chain Pret a Manger. They kind of have them. They kind of have them all over the place, and and it's it's basically ready to eat foods. You know, sandwiches and salads and that kind of thing. Yeah. They don't use plastic. They use paper, cellophane covers, so you can see the salad. Um, and they do a tremendous job, and the stuff doesn't you know doesn't go through the packaging. I mean, these solutions are all around us, right. and it's really a matter of laziness yeah. that um, we continue to be as environmentally punishing as we are. And, and I, I know that uh, burning endless cubic, you know, cubic yards of jet fuel to fly around the world, engaging in sustainability projects, is uh, you know a little strange. Mm-hmm. I understand that uh, yeah. we're deeply bound to this toxic system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I guess I want to just opine and say that um, the fossil fuel countries, the Russia's, the, the the Saudi Arabia, the Coke Corporation, and mm-hmm. other people like that are following the big tobacco playbook of denial, denial, denial. And I interviewed a man who wrote a book on climate science denial. And guess what? He cited the Moonies, my former group, as the Center for Climate Science Denial for the past 50 years. Wow. Yeah. And that was an eye-opener because... um, but it's disinformation. And when people believe disinformation, it's not that they're stupid, it's that they are trusting the information source and not opening their eyes to see the fact that we're having floods everywhere. Sure, you know, sure. And, and other things like that. And um, 
yeah, we need a, 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 a massive cultural reshift around the world f- to, you know, target planetary survival. And like, let's plan backwards from what do we need to do now to plan for planetary survival? Sure, sure. And, you know, some of the, I mean, we're very fortunate in Western Massachusetts, where I live, for example, that we have hundreds of small farms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, big ag is a real problem. On the one hand, big agriculture feeds a lot of people, and we should be grateful for that. But on the other hand, uh, centralized, gigantic farms versus more modest, uh, small to medium-sized farms put put the entire food system and and the population at a disadvantage, mm-hmm. environmentally, nutritionally, safety wise, and all of that. So we, you know, we have a, a program here called Local Heroes, mm-hmm. and it's all of these farmers. And like I know. Uh, we run out of tomatoes or zucchini and we're just about to cook dinner. I can hop in my car, go down the street. There's a little stand. I can get both of those things, put the dollars into a, a lock box. There's not even somebody there hmm. and come back home. We get our tomatoes and zucchini or go a little further down the road and get sweet corn or go to somebody else and get their, their hot sauce. And I think we, um, we would do very, very well to, take some of the things that are gigantic and break them up into smaller bits, uh, yes. much more regionalized. And, and to an extent, you know, that's happening somewhat here. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm moving out to be near you. So yeah. I'm psyched to be yeah, yeah. closer, my friend. I'll be yeah. in Northampton. You're, you're south of, of Amherst. Would you mind in the time that we have sharing some of your knowledge about meditation and how people can uh, develop a practice as well as yoga and, 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 and the values that you found. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, I, I was fortunate to take up meditation and yoga in 1970. Mm-hmm. And I found I had a real love for it. I initially started with yoga with uh, Richard Hittleman's 28 day yoga plan, which was a popular paperback book. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to take 28 days to go through all the stuff, but I was very impatient. So after about four days of practice, I said, well, screw that. And so I, I just started to do the whole thing. Granted, not necessarily well. It took a while. I mean, I broke a few lamps in the process of falling <laughs> over from headstands and stuff like that. But um I also uh, wound up starting meditation practice at the same time. And um, I have found that for me, it helps me greatly in terms of inner balance. Uh, I know that I'm, I, while I do suffer stress in some circumstances, I seem to be far less stressed out than most of the people I encounter or know. Mm-hmm. And I also uh, find that, you know, yoga practice has kept me healthy, Steve. I mean, doing you, you travel a lot, you know what it's like in and out of planes, in and out of hotels, in and out of restaurants. Um, This is not the healthiest lifestyle on earth. And so, you know, carrying a yoga practice, which requires no equipment. I mean, I do have a nice cloth yoga mat, but, um, and doesn't require a gym membership, and you don't have to go any place to do it once you learn how to practice. Right. Um, it's been an absolute godsend for me, and I've been very fortunate. I spent about, I don't know, 42 or so years teaching uh, yoga. You know, I, had, I for the last bunch of years that I was doing that, I kind of got brought out of mothballs by different people who wanted me to go to yoga conferences and teach. Um, And I don't teach now because I'm just too full doing other things. But I've been very fortunate to turn thousands of people onto yoga practice, Mm -hmm. especially to a group of methods called the five Tibetans. Oh, yeah, sure. I have a book out called the five Tibetans. It's published in 28 countries. Uh, I've, you know, been fortunate to do the five Tibetans on ABC television, on Fox in a hundred countries on the Dr. Oz show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like sharing this. Um, 
you don't have to believe in Hindu deities to practice yoga. Yeah. You don't have to subscribe to any particular doctrine. Uh, you don't have to have, you know, a guru. You don't have to wear beads. Um, I mean, if people do, fine. Great. Right. But um, the practice is everything. Hmm. So daily meditation calms the mind, relaxes you. We know that it enhances brain function in a lot of different ways. Yeah. I've used meditation to uh, subdue pain from injuries. Mm. You know, if, if I've got, I mean, I've had some very grave injuries in my life, mm. serious, devastating head and spinal injuries. Mm. And um, I've been able to, at the times when I've needed to, to sit down in meditation and to bring myself into a state where for a time, I'm either in far less pain or in no pain at all. Mm. So, it, you know, the, one of the things that happens with meditation is that you can gain some control over what are considered involuntary functions. Mm. Your heartbeat, your blood pressure, brainwave activity. I've had some EEGs, electroencephalographs done um, on me because I have had some head injuries. And um, sometimes the people operating these things have been concerned that the machine isn't working right because they get aberrant brainwave activity. And I'll say, oh, if you want me to stop that, I will. I was just, you know, in meditation because I got nothing else to do here. I'm just sitting in this chair or I'm lying on this cot. Interesting. And, and um, you know, I, I am able to regulate body heat, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and these are things that, you know, this isn't a miracle. These aren't magical powers. The, right. You know, it's just you learn to do these things just as we see athletes perform physical activities that you and I can't do. We can't right. start to do like, OK, that was just a double backflip on the balance. Beam. <laughs> I would die. Right. Right. There would be a spinal injury right there. Um, so it's really a matter of developing certain abilities that can be helpful. You know, when I'm in a plane, if I'm on a long plane trip, I go into kind of a, a reptilian meditation state very often and just completely relax and tune out everything else. And it makes that time much healthier for me. So would you share, are you doing a breathing meditation, a mantric meditation? What's... What's your fave? I um, will often, for the first couple of minutes, uh, repeat a mantra in my mind. And that's just kind of to sink myself into a meditative state. And then after that, um, you know, keep in mind, I've been doing this for 50, whatever, 54 years. Um, I just tend to hang out in a meditative state uh you know, I, I am breathing, but I'm not necessarily focused on my breath. Got it. Uh, I just kind of go deep inside. Mm -hmm. I think that there are many good methods of meditation. Um, you know, there are a lot of talented people, John Kabat-Zinn and others out there teaching, you know, non-denominational meditations. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think it's really a matter, you know, if people can dedicate even 20 minutes mm -hmm. a day, they can get gains. One of the things that people are concerned about with yoga practice or with meditation is that it's just too hard mm -hmm. or I don't have enough time. Do 10 minutes of yoga three times a week. Mm -hmm. Start there. Uh, you know, when I, when I was teaching a lot, people would say, I'm going to start doing, you know, three hours of yoga every day. And I knew with absolute certainty that those people were going to be the ones who didn't wind up practicing at all. But the ones who said, yeah, you know, I'm incorporating like, like almost 25 minutes a day now, and I'm really liking it. They're the ones who develop. Yeah, start small, slow and yeah. steady um, yeah. to the to tortoise the thing. Right, right. Well, build it into your life. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the real question with good dietary habits, uh, responsible environmental practices, um, 
you know, kind and loving relationships, uh, you know, good nutrition, healing herbs, meditation, yoga, all of these things can help us to live a more balanced and harmonious life. Yep. Yep. And if we can do that, then we operate in the world in a, in a, in a friendlier and kind of more expansive way. And I, you know, I mean, I know without question that one of my secrets, if you will, out on the trail is that I'm very friendly and I'm very respectful. I never go in, well, I'm the expert here. I'm an ethnobotanist. I taught at a university. That's bullshit. Right. Okay. I go in and I'm like, you guys are the experts. I really don't know this thing. You know, show me around, teach me. And and then, and then, you know, we get involved in other things and we're eating at their house and we're playing with their kids and we're going to the waterfall and we're picking some taro and bananas on the way. And it all just kind of rolls like that. Yeah, beginner's yeah. mind is always a, a wise thing. Well, yes. And, and, you know, we can, we can be strong people and capable people and determined people and still be very kind and respectful. Yeah. And have a purpose beyond ourselves, you know, yeah. to contribute yeah. to others, to humanity. Well, you know, I have, I, I was brought up by ministers and broadcasters. Okay. So, so the ministers in the family really kind of imbued me with a sense of service to yeah. others. Yeah. And the broadcasters and my mother, especially, you knew my mom. Uh, um, great lady. You know, she, that really helped me to understand the benefits and value of broader communication. And I've been extremely fortunate, as have you, you know, and, and it's because of the good work you do that you've gotten so much media. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, to be on the major networks, I mean, I had, I had nine years on Fox. Mm -hmm. In a hundred countries, Steve, I used to go through airports in Europe and people go, you're that medicine guy, right? That's <laughs> like, great. Yeah, I'm that medicine guy. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, they, they, I liked that one about the such and such, you know, and right. then of course they would follow up with that. Listen, I got a pain and you know, what, what do you have for it? But, um, you know, sharing, sharing knowledge sharing understanding, sharing insights, which is something you do all the time, so you know it very well. Um, it's a gift to be able to do this. Yeah. It's a privilege. Yeah. You know, I know, I know I'm insanely privileged yeah. to be able to do this work and do it well and keep doing it now in my 70s. I mean, what a godsend. Yeah, it's it has been a journey. Uh, you're definitely a go-to for me Hey Chris, I'm having stomach digestion <laughs> things. He's like, take this bottle of digestive enzymes. Right, take right, take right. three of them. Yeah. Um, and I've been, and it's helping. Thank yeah. you. Well, th these things do. Yeah. Know? And and part of the part of the challenge in my work, let's say I go to uh, a forest area in Africa or in South America, or whatever, and work with some, you know, learn about some particular barks or roots or whatever that are in abundance enough that they won't be endangered okay. if they go into trade. Mm -hmm. People aren't going to sit and boil this stuff in a pot. They're not going to do that. They need something that's convenient, that's in modern dosage forms. Right. And so I work with companies who are very, very sophisticated, high-tech companies who turn these plants into extracts that then go into, you know, liquid products and tablets and capsules so that people can have recognizable, friendly, familiar forms right. to take these. I mean, I'm perfectly happy to sit with a shaman and, and have them boil something up in a pot in the woods and drink it. But... Um, I know that's not within the reach of most people or within the comfort zone of right. more people. Right. Yeah, exactly. So what's your next trip and what, what exciting <laughs> things are on the horizon, do you think? Well, in a couple of weeks, I'll take off to uh, France and I'll be in the Champagne district for the grape harvest hmm. because a company that I work with, Burkem, 
makes a grape seed extract that is very high in a particular antioxidant compound called OPC, mm -hmm. which has hundreds and hundreds of medical studies to support its benefits for you know, cardiovascular health and immune function and brain function and, and you know, healthier tissue throughout the body and, and all of that. So I'll, I'll go to see this particular harvest. Then I'll go to the hops harvest. You know, we're used to thinking about hops in terms of its contribution to beer making. Right. But the bitter principles of hops are profoundly anti-inflammatory. Mm. And inflammation is part and parcel of every chronic uh, health disorder, every chronic health disorder, whether it's diabetes or, or you know, tooth decay. And so having natural, safe anti-inflammatories um, is just a highly desirable thing. So I'll, I'll spend some time there. I'll be going to Vietnam for the coffee harvest uh, a little while after that. Um, unroasted coffee, especially unroasted uh, Robusta coffee, which is the coffee that has less flavor but more caffeine, um, is very protective for the body and helps with metabolism overall. So I'm constantly going to, I like to go to harvests. I was just with a group of people up in the Peruvian Andes. Uh, we work at a, an altitude of about 14 and a half thousand feet up there wow. uh, with the, the, the harvest of maca, which many people know as, as something that you throw a scoop of into a, a blender and it, it helps you to, to have more energy and stamina. And that is something I've been working with since 98. But I was just there a couple of weeks ago, mm. continuing those relationships and continuing that work. And after that, I don't know where I'll go, Steve. I, I, um, you know, I haven't been to the Amazon now in, gee, it's been four years. I mean, I, I, I've been to the Amazon, spent time there like 35 times. I've, I've lived, you know, with native people uh on the river and um you know i've had some marvelous marvelous experiences and learned a lot about the medicines there but it has been a while and i'm very eager to get back and i, I need to find a project that will get me back there okay well anybody listening looking for a project medicinehunter.com right that's right that's and my website any new books you're working on or documentaries or well i am i am working on um a revised version of my book psyche delicacies coffee chocolate chilies kava and cannabis and why they're good for you and i may, <laughs> you know, may break Great. out i may break out just the coffee and chocolate part as a, as a separate small book i've been sort of slowly working on that. And I, and I have a couple of other ideas in, in progress. With all the travel, it's hard for me to be consistent about writing as much as I would like to at this point in time. But I do enjoy, you know, like you, I do enjoy putting out books that inform people about things that I think are of value and, and thankfully readers do as well. Yeah, yeah. sure. Chris Killam. Mr. Christopher S. Killam is a gentle, grateful, romantic, gigantic genius. <laughs> Lawrence Cherniak. That's the guy who wrote the great books of hashish. The, the single most astonishing books on hashish in the world. And, and what a kind, kind, kind quote. Yeah. yeah. And you also got a blurb from uh, Richard Branson in his book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Screw yeah. business as usual. Yeah, yeah. No, I was fortunate for that. We never did wind up doing the project that he talked about, but it was very kind of him to to include a a, a small section on me in his book. Yep, I'm just you you're you 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 have so much um, background and everything. All I can say is you're very very I'm very grateful to have you as my friend. Well, for so many years. Likewise, Steve, and I'm glad that we're uh, you know going to be closer to each other after a bit of a hiatus there. Yeah, but, no, it'll be fun. Yeah, uh, and I'm um, looking uh, forward to a new chapter in my life, and uh, you know, new circles of contact and such, and hopefully right. we can uh, depolarize 
the political situation and teach people about the influence continuum and the bite model and malignant narcissists and how to how to treat each other with humane humanity and respect all the things you're you're teaching as a yogi as a meditation teacher and as an ethnobotanist i mean you're you're really contributing so well i think we're both doing that work you know in different in different ways with our different skills i mean i've long been an admirer of your work and i think that the thing is that if we can bring people as you know many people don't necessarily know how to think mm. they they have thoughts but they don't necessarily get the training to understand right. how to think about the world right um my particular sectors of interest if i communicate them well help people to think about their lives and integrating you know being more harmonious people uh your work with basically freeing the mind so that people people can make their own choices mm -hmm. and and hopefully good healthy choices this is phenomenal stuff mm -hmm. we come we come at it in in somewhat different ways but we're really spokes radiating out of the same hub of integration and understanding yeah i love that that's a beautiful metaphor and a hub and spokes and uh, it's going to take a village a lot of brilliant people working together using yeah. their creative genius yeah. to, to be focused on solutions like future solutions that will right, going to work right, for right. all of us so as we wrap up any last words i'll give you the last word my man well gee the last word last words are always tough because I, I got about 75 things that come to mind but okay i i think i think this i have found in my life that one of the most gratifying things i could ever imagine is doing what i love mm. and i would encourage people um you know, there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, I, I couldn't do that. Uh, the fact is, everybody, almost everybody can take some time out to do what they love, mm -hmm. whether it's large or small. I mean, I just read this amazing New York Times article about these people who are utterly devoted to winning ribbons at state fairs for their baked goods. And they're funny and they're friendly and they're talented and they're driven and they go at this with, you know, full energy and they love it and they do other things. I mean, they have jobs, right. they have families, all that. Um, it, I think, I think if there's something you love, if there's something you would like to do, even if it means that you only get to do a little bit of it and spend a little time, the results will be very gratifying. We, yeah. we need love in our lives, but we also need to engage ourselves with those things that we love so that we are nourished. Yeah. So I guess if those are words of wisdom, that's the best I've got at the moment. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Christopher Killam, uh, medicinehunter.com. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's always a pleasure. Steve Hassan here. You know, it's been decades since my family rescued me from the Moonies. I've been at this for over 47 years. The need has never been greater. If you're able, please consider hitting the super thanks button below and it'll help us to do better. Every penny will help us toward our goal of educating the planet about undue influence. Remember, it's your mind, only you should control it.